I'm going to get Brian in a second to, to plug something for next week. But to give you a bit of context, we've been in um, the lead up to Easter. It's Lent at the moment. Uh, we're looking at the resurrection of Jesus and why that's so important that um, Christ is indeed uh, risen. And there's plenty of significance um, in the, the events of Jesus' life with his disciples leading up to the resurrection. But if we don't look specifically at, at the fact that Jesus is risen himself and that that's what we're celebrating on Easter Sunday, well, we might not really catch the the full meaning of what we're actually celebrating in three weeks' time. And yes, it's three weeks' time um, is Easter Sunday. So we're just looking a bit more closely at the resurrection this year. And um, next week we're going to um, hone in on the resurrection itself, and Brian's going to um, talk about um, a fishy story. So Brian, what exactly is a fishy story? not going to tell you. Nope. But when I was preparing, and still preparing, for what we'll say, uh, that title occurred to me as very apt. And it occurred to me as very apt for three reasons, and I'm not going to tell you. (laughs) But if somebody can come up to me after uh, the service and tell me what my three reasons were, then there'll be a reward, like... um, a free subscription to the resource library or something like that. (laughs) Or even better, a block of saturated fats. (laughs) But you've got to know all three reasons. And you better tell me quietly in case anybody else gets the saturated fat. I want to uh, talk today about, um, to keep keep looking at the implications of the resurrection for us. As said, um, Brian will hone in more on the resurrection itself next week. But to keep looking at, well, what what does this really mean for us? If Jesus is really uh, risen, if he's really alive, um, what's the implications for us here in 2016? And a good way to do that is to look at the interactions between Jesus and his followers after he was raised from the dead rather than before and in the lead-up. Um, you might remember that uh, each Gospel writer, um, Matthew, Mark, Luke and John, re- recount a different aspect of Jesus' final commission, his final words and sending out um, to his followers. And the writer Luke, who writes the best Gospel, writes... Um, no? <laughs> nothing. Writes of Jesus' words with a particular focus on witness and testimony and, and sharing and words... This witness, be my witnesses um, in all the earth. And we begin to see that on, um, in, in a passage I've kind of skipped over a couple of weeks in the last month, um, which is this, this encounter between Jesus and a couple of people on the road to Emmaus. Um, you might have heard of, of this story. And um, my conviction, having read and studied it again this week, is that there's a message in this for us. And what it is, is what we experience, we share or we, we share what we experience. And so I'll develop that a little bit, but that's sort of in a nutshell for today. So let me pray, and I'll um, read the passage. Father, we thank you for this time together, and um, we ask that as we open the Scriptures now, Lord, your Holy Spirit would open up our hearts and our ears, um, that we would hear your word for us right now today. We thank you for Jesus. We thank you... Uh, that he died and rose again for our sake and sent his Holy Spirit to come and show us the truth. Show us that truth today, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, So the context uh, for today in in the passage is that the tomb has been discovered as being empty um, by a couple of women who went and saw on on the Sunday morning. The majority of the disciples who don't believe uh, sorry, the majority of the disciples don't believe what the women are saying. Oh, I'm not really sure, you know, could it really be empty? Except Peter, he runs out, sees it for himself, sees the linen lying there, there's nobody, and he wonders to himself what has happened. That's so far in the last chapter of Luke, and then we read this. Now on that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking with each other about everything that had happened. As they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them. But they were kept from recognising him. 
And based on um, the information we have from a couple of other sources, um, like John's Gospel, um, it would seem that these two followers, their names are Cleopas, which we've seen in a second, and probably his wife Mary, because she was in Jerusalem at the time. It might not have been her, but if it wasn't, then he would have left her in Jerusalem and went home with someone else, which is unlikely. So it's probably Cleopas and his wife named Mary. He, Jesus, asked them, What are you discussing together as you walk along? They stood still, their faces downcast. One of them, named Cleopas, asked him, Are you the only one visiting Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? What things? he asked. Now already this is kind of an amusing scene. Um, They are asking the very one who was crucified. Are you the only one who hasn't heard? needs to go up a little bit, guys. Um, And in classic Jesus style, as they ask him, are you the only one that hasn't heard? He plays along. What are you talking about? Well, he was the very one who was crucified. But what are you talking about? And besides just being humorous, I wonder if Jesus asked that question for a reason. He could have jumped straight in and said, "Um, yeah, I know. I'll tell you what happened and why it happened. I was directly involved which he does a little bit further on, not in that tone, but he says everything that's gone on. But in the meantime, this happens. They, they respond this way. About Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. The chief priests and, rule, and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. And what is more, it's the third day since all this took place. In addition, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning but didn't find his body. They came and told us that they'd seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Then some of our companions went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said. But they did not see Jesus. At this point, Jesus challenges them about their lack of faith. He says to them, how foolish you are. He's sort of saying, you know, you should have understood all this. This is what I've been preparing you for. How foolish you are. How slow to believe all the prophets have spoken. Did the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he said to them, He explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. Now, at first glance, this kind of looks like Jesus testing them and then rebuking them. Come on, guys, you should have got this by now. What are you doing? But let's take a closer look. First of all, it says, God kept them from recognizing him. Something's going on here. And it's probably not just a mean trick that God's playing, disguising Jesus. There's a lesson that God's wanting them to learn. And because they don't recognise him, they say, you must be the only one who hasn't heard. And therefore Jesus uses the opportunity not to rebuke them yet, but say, well, if I haven't heard, what things? And in doing so, he gives them an opportunity to share. Right then and then, to share the news that they've been hearing. Now, obviously, they don't have it quite all together yet because Jesus needs to point out to them that all this needed to happen and it was part of the plan and that they've lacked faith in this. And they'll eventually realise that he is alive, not just kind of, oh, we're confused. But consider if you or I were in this hypothetical position. It's a couple of days after Jesus was crucified, after he died. You're a follower of Jesus. It's three days after you saw him crucified. Somebody has put you on the spot about this guy. Well, what is it about this Jesus? Someone's put you on the spot, challenged you to speak about him. I'm going to read this passage again with literally just a couple of words changed at the end. As if this was, and consider if this was your testimony as someone who's been put on the spot about Jesus just a few days after. He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed, because God, before God and all the people, the chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death and they crucified him. We had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. And what is more, it is the third day since all this took place. 
In addition, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning, but didn't find his body. They came and told us that they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Then some of our companions went to the tomb and found it, just as the women had said. Can you believe it? He's alive. Now, if that were your testimony, it's pretty solid, right? That's exactly what we are called to share. You know, we've, we've seen he's alive. Now, two things jumped out at me about this. Jesus has given these two, as I said, an opportunity to share, to testify, to bear witness about what has happened. Yes, they didn't get it right, 100%. But this is what Jesus did time and time and time again with his followers. He gave them a chance to learn and fail. He gave them a chance to try so when they mucked it up, he could lovingly correct them. He could show them, no, 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 you're not quite right. You know, the guys who went in, oh, we couldn't, we couldn't um, pray that the demon would come out of these people. Jesus goes, yeah, 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 that's all right. You got it wrong. That one requires prayer and fasting. He'd send them out two by two. The very first th- time he did that, they were unlikely to have the kind of power and authority that Jesus had when we, he went out and prayed for people and shared the kingdom with people. They would have tried and they would have marked it up a bit. And he, they would come back and he would correct them and he would help them. Jesus does this over and over again. Do we do that? Do we allow opportunities for people to have a go, to learn from their mistakes in a safe environment, especially when it comes to sharing our faith or our story or sharing our testimony about Jesus? And if we did this, I think we'd be more confident in the sharing of our own story and our faith in the good news of Jesus with people who might not accept it immediately. If we practiced on each other, if we shared with each other, we'd become a bit more confident. We'd learn from our mistakes. And so that's the first thing, that Jesus gives these guys an opportunity, man and woman, an opportunity to share the testimony as preparation for what's to come. But there's another thing in here that's really clear about what's missing in the equation, in their, their story, their testimony at first. And that is they haven't yet experienced for themselves, the reality of Jesus being alive. They have not yet experienced for themselves the risen Christ. They haven't, even though he's right in front of them, remember he's disguised. They haven't seen with their own eyes who the risen Jesus. Why would God do that? Why would God disguise Jesus? It's to give them an opportunity to share and realize what's missing in their testimony, that we have seen the risen one. Not just, oh, Peter said him and the women said there were some angels who came down and we're all confused now. We've seen the risen Jesus. And this is exactly what we must recognize. We will only share what we experience ourselves. Our testimony will be shaped by our experience of the risen Jesus. Um, Anyone heard of Doubting Thomas? Right now, this is a slightly different angle on the whole. You know, we we share what we experience because doubting Thomas was this guy who didn't believe. I'm not going to believe until I put my hand in his side and feel the scars. Well, Jesus was there and said, "Thomas, come and I'll show you my scars. It's really me." And after that interaction, Jesus says, "Blessed, uh, oh, you have seen and believed. Blessed are those who um, have not seen yet still believe." And so absolutely, there is an element of faith in this whole thing, an element of we are not going to have Jesus pop up right here, stand in front of me, look, here's the scars, I'm alive, and then leave again. There's an element of faith in us believing in this resurrection, absolutely. But there's no question that a real experience of Jesus himself, a real personal experience of Jesus himself, fuels and enhances our own testimony and the desire to share it. Listen to what happens next in this scenario. This is from verse 28. As they approached the village to which they were going, this is probably their hometown, Jesus continued on as if he were going further. But they urged him strongly, stay with us for it's nearly evening. The day is almost over. So he went in and stayed with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, gave thanks, and broke it. 
and begin to get, began to give it to them. Then their eyes were opened and they recognised him. And he disappeared from their sight. They asked each other, were not our hearts burning within us while we talked while he talked on the road and opened the scriptures to us, they got up, returned at once to Jerusalem. There they found the eleven and those with them assembled together, saying, It is true, the Lord, oh, and, and they were saying, It is true, the Lord has risen and has appeared to Simon. Then the two told what had happened on the way for them and how Jesus was recognized by them when he broke bread. And there's the bit that their original testimony needed to take it from, you of little faith, you fools, to fantastic, you've got it, go and share that with others. The bit they were missing was they experienced Jesus firsthand. They saw him. And then their testimony changed, only slightly, a bit like that last line changing, his life. But that small shift was so important. And as we seek, the Billabong, this community here, seek to be people who promote life in our communities, that's our mission statement, that's our mandate, that's what we're about. Um, We mean, by life, we mean life in Christ. And we must make no mistake about that. It's not to promote some kind of nice life with lots of money and happiness or something. Jesus' life. It simply won't do, if that's who we are, people who promote life in our communities, it simply won't do for us to neglect opportunities with each other to share our testimony over coffee, dinner tables, on drives to the airport, whatever it might be. But it also won't do for us to neglect opportunities to truly experience this Jesus that we share. To hear his voice to feel his heartbeat, to see his face in the poor and needy. And what this all comes down to is that um, the intentional time we spend with each other is how we experience Jesus. We experience Jesus in community. We promote him in community. It's this radical, early church-style, Jesus-centred community that we're going for, but a bit like even what Rick Rick and Louise were sharing before. And um, I've, I know I've shared um, here uh, on a Sunday before that the single most important factor for me in the last couple of years of learning to hear the voice of Jesus and encounter him has been a dedicated band of, of brothers in Christ who are committed to walking alongside each other and, and myself and asking the question, how is God breaking into your world right now? How is God speaking to you? What is he saying? What is that? How is that changing your life? And um, I don't know about you, but I need that. I've had about two months just before the, like this Thursday. I had about two, maybe even three months of that group not meeting, and I felt like a part of my soul was beginning to be missing. It's that important for me. And so I want to ask all of us today, who is it? What is it and who is it that's in your life right now who, or who needs to be? Who is it who needs to be in your life right now who makes the difference between you encountering Jesus on a regular basis, hearing what he's saying to you, or going weeks without experiencing his presence in your life? And so if the answer to that question is legitimately, I don't know, help me find someone... Um, I would love to try and point you in the right direction if I can. Coming back to the scripture, being present um, with and experiencing for ourselves the risen Christ, it not only enhances our testimony because we can share how we've encountered him, but it fuels our motivation. Have a look at this again from verse 28. As they approached the village to which they were going, Jesus continued on, as if he were going farther. But they urged him strongly, stay with us, for it's nearly evening. The day is almost over. So he went in to stay with them. Before they really knew who they were talking to, they loved hearing what Jesus was saying. They loved receiving from him. Our hearts were burning within us as he shared all this wisdom. 
They're excited to hear more of it. And I, don't know, I, I know that all of you don't go home from church on a Sunday and listen to five more recordings of my sermons because you're just so inspired and energised and it's just such great stuff. But I, I know, um, and it, it might be other preachers or it might be other kind of sources of inspiration. I know I used to love listening to podcasts and that kind of thing. Um, it's like food for the soul. Some people here listen to some um, podcasts from all over the world. Um, they loved hearing this wisdom. These guys on the road, they love, their, their hearts burned within them. But ultimately, Jesus had other plans for them, for, the, then for them to feel warm fuzzies because of this wisdom they were hearing. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, gave thanks, broke it and gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened and they recognised him and he disappeared from their sight. No more talking, no more sharing. Were our hearts not burning within us while he talked to us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? They got up and returned at once to Jerusalem. So other translations say within the hour, that very hour, they went back to Jerusalem. And there they found the eleven, those with them assembled together, saying, It's true, the Lord's risen and appeared to Simon. And then they, the two, told what had happened on the way, how Jesus was recognised by them when he broke bread. As soon as they recognised who it was, who they encountered. Jesus' talk, talking, was done. His task was done there. He needed not say another word, and immediately they desired not more wisdom and inspiration and, and, and sharing, but a chance to share, not receive more. They needed to give. A shift happened when he revealed himself to them. And when we have a revelation of who Jesus is, no matter how big or small, that's when our hearts shift as well. Rather than wanting to you know, come to this space or another space to, to hear more and learn more and receive more, our desire is to go and speak and teach and give. Fueled and motivated, sure, by the times where we come together to, to receive. But the desire when we experience Jesus is not, oh, Jesus, stay here. We need to hear more of you sharing with us like on the road. It's, we've got to go and share this. Jesus' job was done when they saw who he was and he disappeared. So what is it that you and I need to do to position ourselves, to position your family in a place where the Lord Jesus, the risen Lord Jesus, can come, can come close? I think we need to ask ourselves that question. How is it we need to position ourselves? And that's so that we can share our real experience, our own real experience of the risen Christ, as well as form a deep desire to go and share, to, to give, to speak. I want to pray that even in this space this morning, he would do that for us, that he'd reveal himself to us. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we believe that you are alive. Not just risen and then disappeared again, but risen and alive and present with us. And Lord, sometimes we need a reminder. We need you to reveal yourself to us so that we can recognize that you're right here and that in your presence we would fall to our knees in worship. And from that place we would get up to go and share what we've experienced. Holy Spirit, I pray that even this morning in this room and in this moment, you would reveal to each and every person here who you really are and therefore that we would understand more of who we are. Reveal to us your Son, Heavenly Father. And as we seek to live in community, in the kind of community that Jesus exemplified, would we more and more experience who you are, Christ, by sharing and teaching and training and discipling each other? May we see you in community because it's exactly who you said the church is supposed to be, is your body on this earth with you as the head. We thank you for that truth. And as we seek to live more and more in that kind of radical Christ-like early church kind of community, would we see you, experience you for ourselves? 
And we pray that in Jesus' name.